Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Prada Museum in Madrid, Spain. We're continuing our Wednesday morning series of short conversations in English, this program that we do with the help of the American friends of the Prada Museum. Now, cliches can be so misleading in art history, we know, right? But every once in a while, there's one that might be worth taking seriously, like Bartolomé Esteban Murillo being the quintessential painter of the Immaculate Conception. And this is what we're going to see today. This is the Immaculate Conception of the Venerables by Murillo. Now we could talk about so many different things with this painting that it's hard to fit it all in 10 minutes. We could talk about the iconography of the Immaculate Conception, what it represents and why it was so important in the 17th century. We could talk about fads in art history. We could talk about the rise and the fall and the rise again of the popularity of Murillo or Murillo mania. We could also talk about how this painting came to be and how it left Spain and how it came back. But first, let's just talk about the, the Immaculate Conception and what it is. The Immaculate Conception is the idea that the Virgin Mary was free from sin since the moment of her conception. According to Catholic dogma, everyone is born with original sin, which is washed away in baptism. But being the mother of God, this is problematic for Mary to have ever been stained with sin, even original sin. So the Immaculate the Immaculate Conception explains that Mary was the exception to this rule, that she was free from all sin ever since the moment of her conception. But this hasn't always been part of Catholic dogma. There was actually a heated discussion on this, debating whether or not to accept it as official church teaching. And the Franciscan and the Dominican religious orders were divided on this topic, although it was the Franciscan support um, of the conception that, that eventually prevailed. And even though uh, the Immaculate Conception wouldn't actually be observed by the rest of the church until the 19th century, Spain would really be the leading advocate for turning this mystery into Catholic dogma, resulting in the production of a lot of devotional images like this one. And specifically in Seville, the enthusiasm for this mystery of faith is evident in the works of civilian artists like Francisco Pacheco, Herrera el Viejo, Zurbarán, and Murillo. Now, over the course of his career, Murillo painted around two dozen Immaculate Conceptions, possibly more than any other Spanish painter at the time. And he even created his own visual formula for it, kind of blending what would be the representation of an Immaculate Conception with this essential base of Mary, dressed in blue and white, her arms folded across her chest, and looking upwards in this celestial setting filled with light and clouds, and angels. We can also see the crescent moon that she's standing on. And the golden color that surrounds Mary kind of reminds us of sunlight. And these are references to the apocalypse because the woman of the apocalypse was often identified as the church or as Mary who was adorned with sun and moon and stars. And so Murillo blended this with the representation of the Assumption. The Assumption is to heaven when she was taken into heaven, body and soul, which is why we get this strong upward feeling in this painting. Everything seems to swirl and ascend. And we can start with the wide base here with the angels kind of fluttering around. And this base gets gets thinner as we rise. We see how wide the base is and how this whole figure gets thinner. Her clothing and her body, the volume is all reduced as we get higher and higher and culminates in her gaze cast upward with the angels continuing to spiral around her and above her and all of us gives us this feeling of movement, of ascension. And this was painted, we can get close here to see this now, because this was painted uh, between 1660 and 1665, when Maria was already uh, a mature, successful artist, and as he advanced in his career, his brush strokes became increasingly loose, and he's renowned for this lightness, this ease of his brush strokes that produced these vaporous forms, these lines that are blurred, and warm light and color really take center stage to produce these these delicate images. And Maria was apparently a calm and sweet-natured man, which might explain some of this 
this personal preference, his personal artistic expression, but furthermore, he was also painting in the world of the Counter-Reformation. And in art, um, this aim to integrate religion into the everyday environment, enhancing the sense of the mystical in a way that was relatable and understandable to the everyday spectator. And also underlining the values of family life, and this uh, resulted in a shift away from the dark images, the hardships of, of martyrdom, and an abundance of images of uh, themes related to the Holy Family. And we can see this also in other um, of, of Murillo's paintings here, the Virgin of the Rosary. Themes relating to the Holy Family where you can see the Virgin and Child really looking like a mother and son sharing this sweet moment. And these were really popular images at the time. Now let's come back to our painting now. Commissioned between 1660 and 1665 by a canon of the Cathedral of Seville, Justina de Neve, who donated it to the Hospital of the Venerables, a foundation uh, where he was president. And it was a very famous painting right from the beginning. And not all paintings are. Often we look at paintings that are, that are really famous now, but that have been overlooked for centuries. Um, but that's not the case here. This has always been a very famous, very highly regarded painting. Marie was already successful in his lifetime. And he only became more successful, more in high demand after his death, um, which is probably why uh, the French general, Marshal Soult, from Napoleon's army, uh, took interest in this painting and a lot of other paintings during the Napoleonic invasion when he was in Spain. And so he took it with him, along with a lot of other paintings, uh, for his own personal collection. And it was this dispersal of Murillo's works after the Napoleonic invasion that really uh, led to the high point of Murillo mania. This really was the peak of, of Murillo's popularity. And it was actually considered uh, probably the most important creation in the history of Western art at that time. And it wasn't just the most important, the most expensive uh, painting in Soult's collection, it was also um, the most expensive painting ever sold at the time. Because in 1852, when the Louvre bought it from Soult's collection, it was the most expensive painting ever sold. So we hear sometimes about these headlines, right, about the most expensive painting at some auction. Well, this painting would have had that headline in the 19th century. But of course, everything that comes up must come down. And uh, it was perhaps this immense fame that led to a decline in popularity. And Murillo began to be kind of uh, underestimated, undervalued, with these tender images actually being written off as kind of too sweet. And this might have influenced the decision of the Louvre to exchange this painting for a Velazquez of uh, Mariana de Austria from the Prados collection in 1941, which luckily for us is why we have it here today. And thankfully historians have rescued uh, Murillo to contextualize these gentle, delicate, tender images and to acknowledge him as what he is, one of the greatest painters of the 17th century. So I hope you've enjoyed having a closer look at Maria and this Immaculate Conception with me. And we'll see you here again for more conversations next Wednesday.